All right. Hey, everybody. Hello. Hello. Happy, happy Monday. Mm -hmm. Happy Wine for Bet Street Day. How, how is everybody? I'm definitely having a Monday. <laughs> oh, oh. But. Well. I don't know. It's going to get better because we're going to be drinking in a little bit. So there you have it, right? To wet my lips. <laughs> yes. So welcome to Wine for Bet Street. Today we are up to the letter S and we do not have a guest host this this uh, this week, this month, I should say. And so Debbie and I are back to uh, giving the education and we're looking forward to sharing what we learned about Sincere with you this month. So for those of you who do not know me, I am Lori Bud. My husband and I own Dracina Wines in Paso Robles. You can find me on all of the social media as Dracina Wines. And then as the blog and the podcast is Exploring the Wine Glass. So you can find me everywhere. I am a Paso Robles proponent and a Cab Franc champion. So, Deb, how about you? So I'm Debbie Giaquindo. I'm known as the Hudson Valley Wine Goddess. I'm a... Um, certified specialist of wine and a wine location specialist in port and champagne. I'm author of the book, Tapping the Hudson Valley, Day Trips and Weekend Itineraries, Visiting the Hudson Valley Wine Region. And this past weekend, we just opened a restaurant in North Wildwood, New Jersey called Trio North Wildwood. And I think that's about enough on my plate that I can handle. <laughs> I think so. I think so. Well, we're going to start the video. Let's get into it. And then we are going to clink. Okay, that was atrocious. That was atrocious. I'm gonna do that again because I can't deal with that. That we're gonna. <laughs> I like it though. Oh my! I can't hear you. Oh, oh wait. Okay, now can you hear me? I can hear you. Yep. Okay, that was so many different echoes. I don't even know what what was going on with that. There were like four different versions of that song. <laughs> I only heard one. Did you? Yeah. I had four different echoes going on. Oh, I didn't. Oh, all right. Well, good. <laughs> Woohoo. It's Monday. Woohoo. So Monday. there's the new video, Deb. I like it. I like it a lot. Thanks. Uh -huh. Thanks. Hey, I added a little Elmo in there. I did a little bit of uh, fixing things. I like, the, I like the slides. It's cleaner. Yeah. And, you know, we got to get Trio uh, North Wildwood in there and Dracita Wine. So kind of kind of worked with it a little bit, mm -hmm. you know. All right. Next month, new song. Wait till you hear the song. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So it is that time. Finally, finally, finally. Monday at 5.04. It is time what do you got? to. It's so. Oh, OK. I have Pascal. Jo, uh, oh, I think that's, I'm trying to remember there, there was, I was reading on, I've got Anthony and David Gerard. All right. So I did not know this winery. Um, but then when I was doing research, they're pretty well known for Sancerre. So I think, um, <laughs> looking here. Yes. Because they're extremely well known. My sincere comes from the same vineyard. Oh, okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. All and right. Smont stamp names. So we'll get to all that. But yes. Yeah. Because I knew when you said that, Pascal, I was like, I've read that. So, yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to get started right off the bat with the history. Go for it. Um. I just need to do, 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 history. Oh, you know what, Deb? Before I do that, 
we need to clink clink. Yeah, I know. <laughs> clink. Slancha. <laughs> oh wow. Okay. Ooh. Really nice and clean. That is that is crisp. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, so we're going to go into the history of Sancerre. So Sancerre is actually a wine region that is located in the central Loire Valley. And it's cool. It's a medieval town. It's located in the eastern portion, and it looks over the River Loire. And it is mostly known for Sauvignon Blanc. However, there is actually Pinot Noir also planted there. And it is used in uh, Sancerre Rouge and Sancerre Rosé. And I did really try to find a Pinot um, or the the uh, Sancerre Rosé because everybody taught, you know, when you hear Sancerre, everybody goes to that white. And I was really trying to hope to find that, that little oddball uh, wine. But alas, I was unsuccessful. Okay. Um, so as I said, it's best known for Sauvignon Blanc, but prior to the mid 20th century, it was actually known for the light red wines. It really wasn't a white region. It was a red and it didn't become known for the white wines until it uh, became pr a protected appellation. So you can see that Sancerre is located in the easternmost region. Um, and it's actually kind of cool because it's like hundreds of miles away from the most western portion of the Loire Valley. And it actually is closer to Burgundy's Chablis region, which has that same soil, which is that Kermitogen soil that I'm sure Debbie's going to go down the rabbit hole for because right, all that geekiness soil. Um, so it is actually, I'm just going to talk about it briefly. It is um, just a, there you go. Okay. It's a gray colored limestone based soil. And it is, was, it got its name because it was originally found in Kimmeridge, England. And the clay is a calcareous clay. And it also includes limestone. So as I said, that uh, Sincere was actually better known for the, its light reds before that Appalachian protection um, came about. And the reason why it went to white is because of phylloxera. So something great came out of the badness of phylloxera. So when phylloxera hit, um, that's when Sancerre actually changed. So prior to the prior to the destruction in the 1860s, uh, due to phylloxera, Sancerre was actually most known for Gamay and Pinot Noir. So those light uh, uh, light reds. But then what happened? What happened was. Uh, when phylloxera, you know, destroyed everything, when they went to go replant, they realized that the white was doing, would do much better in the environment that they were replanting it to. So um, the white uh, was actually prior to phylloxera, the really only white was a, a chasselas, which is now uh, one of the most important white wines in Switzerland. But then they got rid of that, and that's where they planted to uh, Sauvignon Blanc. So they realized that we all know that phylloxera destroyed the vines and that the way to conquer phylloxera was to graft the European vines onto the American rootstocks. And that Gamay... Laura, you froze. Or am I frozen? Am I still frozen? No, you're not frozen anymore. Oh, okay. Um, so I was say, just saying that the phylloxera, uh, the way to beat the phylloxera is to graft the European vines onto the American vines. But what they realized was that Gamay and the Chasselet uh, and the Pinot Noir didn't really like that 
that very much. So then they planted this or they grafted the Sauvignon Blanc and that took off on those grafted vines. And that's how we got to be Sancerre being known for its Sauvignon Blanc. So overall, Sancerre covers only about a 15 mile stretch of rolling hills on the west bank of the Loire. So there's approximately 7,000 acres of vines and they are devoted to um, uh, Sauvignon Blanc. And there are about double the amount of vines uh, today than when Sancerre's Appalachian was created in 1936. So it is growing substantially. Okay. The village is raised from the valley, and thanks to this, it has made the village a strategic location for most of its history. And the fact that it is raised actually is what allowed Sancerre to grow at, in the 11th century. Uh, but it was evidence, as with like pretty much everywhere, the Romans were there, and they had settled there previously. And... Um, they, it is thought that the Romans, like always, they were the ones who planted the original vineyards. So the village actually grew up as a circle around a church and an abbey, and it was all built in order to protect that. So then in the 12th century, they built the fortress, and it has six uh, defensive towers, and this was all built to protect that abbey, to protect the region. And today, you can actually still climb one of the towers. So this is the Tour de Fife, Faiths. It is built to, it was built to repel the English armies from two attacks during the Hundred Years War. And I mean, I'm not a big history buff, but as I was researching this, Sancerre was like at the center point of so many different wars. Like everybody just wanted this region. So after the Hundred Years War, it was also part, uh, it was also hit pretty hard during the uh, French Wars of Religion, uh, where the town was also the site of the infamous Siege of Sancerre, which took place from January 3rd to August 19, uh, 1573. So this is where the Huguenots or the Protestants population, they actually held out for nearly eight months against the Catholic forces of the king. And then they finally had to succumb because they died of starvation, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's two wars. And then once again, it was a main portion in uh, World War II as the regional center for the French resistance. So it has a lot of history into this little area. So going back to wine, grapes have been grown in Sancerre since the early times. Gregory of Tours mentioned the Sancerre vineyards in his writings as early as 582. And in the 12th century, the vineyards developed significantly under um, Augustine monks at St. Sator and, and then the Sancerre nobility fell in, you know, they were drinking the wine. Sancerre was granted an AOC status in 1936. And then it wasn't until 1959, uh, it wasn't until 1959 that uh, the region was even allowed to produce pinots and rosés um, or red wines and rosés from Pinot Noir. So it it uh, was uh, 20, 23 years between it begetting it becoming an AOC and when the AOC was adjusted to be able to include the red wines. The AOC area has expanded fourfold over the years. And most recently, <clears throat> um, uh, the, the last stats that I could find for the region itself was from night, March of 1998, where the vineyard area is 2,393 acres of white, 335 acres that are dedicated to the reds, and then 260 acres are dedicated to producing rosé. And then what's on the slide here are just the, the actual overall production. So overall, it's making 176,000 um, hectoliters, 
And one hectoliter is uh, about 26.4 gallons. So as I said, varietals are Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir. And then there are regulations of how they can grow. So there is a minimum planting density, which is 6,100 vines per hectare. And they are required to prune um, to a to specifications. So the single or double gallo uh, or cordon de royal. So there are, as with every AOC, there are a lot of regulations going on to pr make them uh, be quality driven. And it's pretty good quality. <laughs> it, sh <laughs> it shows. It shows. I saw an email come through from Michael, and I can't get my emails hung up on my computer. Mm -hmm. Someone wants to email him that link. He wants to get in. He doesn't have a link. Oh. So I, don't, so I put the link in the chat. In the chat? Yeah. Okay. Because I saw it come in on my tablet, but my tablet and oh. my laptop okay. do not talk because they're not compatible. All right. I'll take care of it. Okay. So I can go on to um, characteristics. General characteristics. So Sancerre is situated almost in the middle of the country. And they have beautiful rolling limestone hills and a semi-continental climate. So here's the soil. Now, I was like really getting into it. <laughs> <laughs> Searching it. I'm like, oh, my God. Um, I, was, I was really kind of geeking out on it. Um, but the soil is what brings the complexity and the minerality to the Sauvignon Blanc. The freshness um, comes from the minerality, actually not the acidity. And the um, three different kinds of, of soil here, there's the Terrace Blanc, the Silex, and the Calodes, and I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it correctly. So the Calodes here on the bottom, they are made of small limestone pebbles mixed with clay um, that's dating back to the, uh, I can't say that name of that thing, Kim, Kim Jiren era. Uh, yeah, I think so. I, I don't know how to exactly say it either. I don't know, so, but um, it Kimmeridge, Kimmeridge is the region. So Kimmeridgen. Kimmeridgen. Okay. So the Paris Blanc, which is the Kimmeridgen Marl, it's a calcareous clay with, um, Kimmeridgen limestone. And in the summer, the soil turns white. So see, there's a picture in it. It's white. Um, I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, and silex um, lends the ability to capture and retain the heat, even in the cool areas. So that contributes to the flint taste that you get in the wine. Oops. Hold on. There's more. <laughs> <laughs> um, so digging deeper into the soil, the Terrace Blanc is the Sauvignon Blanc, the powerful body um, that, that it has. And actually, if it's a really good year for, for the grapes, the wine can actually age. And the soil contributes to any of the herbal notes that you might receive in, that, in the wine, the Terrace Blancs. The Colodes contributes to the lemon and the apple notes and the silex, um, you, excuse me, you get the flinty uh, taste to the wine. So we can go into the flavor profile. And, you know, it's, Sincere is such an elegant wine. It really, you know, when you look at Sauvignon Blancs from you know, New Zealand and how lacy acidity and you wake up the next morning with a pith in your mouth. <laughs> this is just, just a really beautiful, 
Sauvignon Blanc. It's it's just really kind of a classy Sauvignon Blanc if you want, you know, to go go with that. Um, so you're gonna find um, gooseberries. You're gonna find flint, kind of gunpowderish, um, refreshing um, minerality, some citrus, and the citrus can be lemon, lime, grapefruit. Uh, you might get some chamomile, some honeysuckle, um, pink grapefruit, Meyer lemon, thyme, um, all that, you know, well, different uh, flavors and aromas that you will get in the wine. So that's all I actually have on characteristics. Oh. I, really, I really think that this is just a really classy Sauvignon Blanc. I I think it's like a Chardonnay Sauvignon Blanc, like or Sauvignon Blanc for Chardonnay because typical uh, typical Sauvignon Blancs that are non sincere are more um, light bodied, high high acidity, yeah. right? You get that salivation, um, and they're light bodied. Uh, they're also you know, I mean, mine is kind of goldish, you know, yellow gold, mm -hmm. um, where, uh, you know, Sauvignon Blancs, when you're thinking of New Zealand or something like that, are more like pale straw. Yeah. So this is more like a pale yellow. And it's just a fuller body to on my palate than, than a, a Sauvignon Blanc, um, whatever. Wow. Um, Get sometimes like a little bit of an oily feeling. Yes. 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 Um, now, I don't know. Is there a regulation of how they have to produce it in terms of staying in bottle, in terms of, you know, I don't, steel tank? I'm unsure. And I think I did read something, but it just didn't in my head. Okay. Usually, usually AOPs have so many, you know, or AOCs, and so I have so many um, ridiculous regulations uh, of how the wine can pre be produced. Um, you know, I'm just, I'm just curious, like malolactic, is that what's causing the body or is there an oak? And, you know, I'm not tasting oak, but it's, it's steel. It's tanks. Now, I know my wine is tanks and it's still a full body. So I'm trying to figure out what, you know, exactly, um, you know, how well, they're getting that body. Soil. Right. That's the flintiness. That, that I think is that flint. I also think it goes back to the soil because um, the silex, which lends the ability that captures the heat and retains the heat in the soil. So even in the cool areas, that particular, the silex soil is going to retain the heat, which maybe is what gives it that extra body. And Yeah, it's, it's interesting because it's a different, it is, it is, the acidity is there, um, but it's a different acidity. It's not, you know, it, it, yeah. it's not that salivating. Like you said, it's more of a coating, you know, versus... Yeah that that high acidity that that you get with in marlboro where you know your tongue is salivating you know as you're like trying to talk after a sip right. and um you're not going to wake up the next morning with the grapefruit pith in your mouth right right and this is yeah. just, like i said it's elegant it's elegant it's classy mm -hmm. it's you know now I don't know where where you where you got yours from. Um, when I bought mine at Total Wine, um, and the average price the prices for these were twenty five to like thirty eight. So well, it's funny you mention that because I got this from my wine club, and it's a thirty five dollar. They say it's a thirty five dollar bottle of wine. But I did a little research, and it was on sale at Total Wine for twenty one ninety nine. Oh wow! So, and how much did they charge? They they charged you the thirty five. Thirty five. No, actually, my wine club is a set amount of money. Every oh month. okay. Oh okay. So. Oh. Okay. Um, but 
I wanted to order more, it would have been $35. Yeah. So I, it's, I, I have to be honest, I don't really drink a lot of Sancerre. Um, I don't really know why, but um, I, it, for me, I kind of like the lighter body. When I think Sauvignon Blanc, I'm in that lighter body mode. You know, this is this is a dinner Sauvignon Blanc. <laughs> this, yeah, I know this isn't one uh, Sauvignon Blanc I take out on the boat, right? Or to the pool, right? Is, you know, definitely. this is yeah, this is as you said, this a sophisticated Sauvignon Blanc. Yes, it's right. got high on and it's it's stilettos and red dress. Yes, it's 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 going out for the evening to show itself off. Where where the Sauvignon Blancs that I think where that I drink more often are you know it's a party, you know yes. light crisp go through, um, go through the go through the uh, wine quickly, uh, and that's another thing. This is thirteen and a half percent alcohol, so it's not high in alcohol, but it's higher than minus what. Two. Yeah, it's higher than, you know, you, you're thinking of those, uh, you know, Marlboro Sauv Blancs. They're usually more around the 12% um, ABV. So I don't know. Um, and that's why I think it's more of like a, if if you like Chardonnay, um, unoaked Chardonnay, I should say. Mm -hmm. I think this is more of, of a Sauvignon Blanc for you. Um, because of that that complexity that's there. Um, and if you're bothered by the acidity in like a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, this, Sauvignon, this type of sin, right. sincere, you won't have a problem. Right. If, if, you're, if you're not a true acid head, I think this is a nice uh, Sauvignon Blanc for you. Um, for me, for for I mean mine was twenty six dollars or twenty five dollars. Um, I I personally would take two of my normal Sauvignon Blancs that for my palate. But if I was going to a dinner and I you know I was going someplace where I was uh, bringing a bottle of wine for a large you know for a larger group of people and we were sitting down and uh, you know you know, enjoying the evening with food and all that, that's where this comes in. Yeah. I think it's a matter of what, you know, what the situation is that you're looking I for. I wouldn't bring it to a barbecue, but I would bring it to a dinner party. Right. Now that's kind of funny because uh, according to Sancerre's website the, itself, um, uh, fried chicken and grilled chicken um, are good for the pinots. <laughs> So if you can find a Pinot from Sincere, then you could bring it to <laughs> bring it to the barbecue. Bring it to the barbecue. There was not a single Pinot uh, where where I was. I uh, and Karen in the chat said that she enjoys the rosés. Um, you know, she's enjoyed uh, Sincere rosés, and I've never had one yeah, of those either. I found the the rosés, the Sincere rosés. So, kind of liquor store yeah so karen if you could give us a little hint on where you're finding them um obviously better than my local total wines um i don't have any really small wine shops here that can kind of cater to certain things so but um so i'm gonna go into my um wine itself if i can find it Okay. So my wine is Pascal Holeve. Um, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. But uh, so as I said to you, Deb, before we got we went live, uh, and it's 2019, I really didn't know one winery from the next. I picked it because it wasn't the cheapest. It wasn't the most expensive. Um, and it had a high rating from, you know, whoever was in Total Wine was recommending it uh, on their little shelf talkers. So I got it. Um, and I'm not going to lie. The label was really cute. It's like a little cloud. 
I think it. I think it's clouds. <laughs> I'm okay. not really sure. Um, and then uh, it says, "Wow, Rud de Chagnel Sancerre." I don't know that. That's a really small font in that cloud. Um, and then as I did the research, I it turned out that it's a pretty popular and pretty well respected uh, winery. So Domaine Pascal Holive. Oops. No. Yeah, no, I just hit the wrong button. I was in it and then I got out of it by accident. Ah, here we go. Okay. All right. So these guys, I'm, I'm so informal. These guys, um, the, the winery kind of pre predates actual wine making uh, for the for this business. So the original business was actually created by uh, Louis and Lucien um, uh, uh, Holivet, and they entered the wine industry in 1926. But this father and son actually created a wine merchant company. So they weren't producing wine, they were they were selling wine. Um, and it wasn't until 1987 that the Pascal um, uh, Holy, Holy v, uh brand was actually created. And Pascal is actually Lewis's great grandson. So at that time, he was actually working for um, uh, Mason Pomeray Champagne. And he apparently still does. So he still is working with them, with the Champagne House, and then uh, he has his own brand. And so in 1990, he built a new winery. And uh, the, it it was made, uh, but at this point, up to this point, it was still made with sourced fruit. And it wasn't until 1993 that... Pascal actually ended up purchasing his first vineyard site. And it was at the urging of his father uh, to say, you know, you want to be making wine from a state fruit so you could be a domain. So in 1993, he finally purchased um, a, wine, a, a vineyard site. And that's when he became a domain. And then in 1995, he actually purchased... Um, uh, 16 acres in Poulet Fumé. And I think that, well, I don't know. I could be talking out my butt here, but I think that's kind of a unique thing with, with this wine is that the fruit, even though it's Sauvignon Blanc, the fruit or this wine is made from fruit from Sancerre and fruit from Poulet Fumé. And those are two very different types of regions. Um, so I think that adds a bit to the complexity of this wine. And I don't know how many other wineries are doing something like that. But he owns vineyard sites in different regions. And he brings them in to produce that, co to produce that complexity within the wine. Um, and then, <clears throat> so this is uh, a a blend of of both uh Poulet Fumé and Sancerre but he's allowed to call it Sancerre and I couldn't I couldn't find what that regulation was to allow it to be called Sancerre like normally you would think it would have to be 100% from that region but his is not and it still has Sancerre on it so um I don't know what what makes that regulation uh in 2000 he actually built another new state-of-the-art uh, winery, and it, he owns approximately 120 acres. And the fruit is made uh, approximately of 80% of the wine is from his estate, and he still does purchase about 20% of the fruit that he uses um, uh, from people that he's had contracts with since the 1980s. So he's got these long-term contracts with these growers and that produces about 20%. So as you can see in this picture, I mean, it's very state-of-the-art. It's all stainless steel tanks. 
he's very much into the kind of natural aspect of winemaking. So it is all indigenous yeast. His goal is to enhance the fruit character in his wines and uh, provide a sheer elegance and precision. Those are the words that he has all over his website is elegance and precision. And then in 2016, to continue with that whole concept of um, elegance and natural, he teamed up with the Dawney family, who are actually pioneers in the organic viticulture. And they were kind of the people who led the way in this region for um, for uh, organic winemaking. And I think that's what you were saying. That's where your your wine, the vineyard comes from. Well, no, my... Mine comes from a vineyard called Les Mons, D A M N E S. Oh, damn. Oh, okay. Hmm. Um, so this is what the bottle looks like. So I, you know, I think it's a vineyard. This makes it look a lot, you know, clearer than what's actually on the bottle itself. But I'm guessing it's a vineyard with some trees and things, but on the label itself, it looks like clouds. Uh, so like I said, this is the 2019 Pascal uh, Holeve Sancerre. I paid $25 for it. And on the capsule itself, it says exceptional lure wine for the connoisseur. So he's setting you up right up from the bat that he's, he's you know, taking himself above the others, that it's not, it's not a entry wine lover wine, right? It's a connoisseur to be able to appreciate what he's doing with this wine. All the fruit is hand harvested from the different vineyard sites, and then they are fermented separately in stainless steel tanks. The vineyards that it comes from actually have three different, three vineyards, three different soils. So 50% of the fruit comes from limestone soils, which he says adds minerality and finesse. 30% comes from vineyards that have lime limestone clay, which he says enhances the fruit and richness. And then 20% comes from uh, vineyards with flint soils, which adds structure and minerality. And as I said, it's 100% indigenous yeast. It, the winery was built to deal with gravity, to produce wine with gravity uh, flow or gravity feed. So it's gentler to the fruit and it is all biodynamically grown <laughs> and this wine spends six months on lees and is a blend of sauvignon blanc like i said from both sincere and uh poulet fumé nice yeah and i agree it is definitely not uh a newbie a newbie wine I'm really liking this. It's mine has mine has the lemon. It's definitely got the flint. It's got the acidity, but instead of being on the sides, it's kind of more on the tip. Um, the finish is very long. Uh, and as you said, it's funny. It's almost like you were tasting this wine. It's got that oilness to it. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's really a, a medium plus to almost a full minus um, bodied wine. Um, and I think it needs food. <laughs> yeah. 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 So mine is Anthony, Anthony and David Gerard. Okay. And it comes from the Les Mons Dames Vineyard. So this Les Mons, oh, I should like pull up my PowerPoint. Um, there aren't that many pictures. I tried to research this um, vineyard, um, but from what I understand, start. This is the Lamont Dam's vineyard, and it is the Grand Crew vineyard for Sauvignon Blanc in, in San Sierra. And um, so this is produced by Anthony and David Gerard. And Anthony Gerard took over um, the domain from his great, that his great grandfather started. And it, 
<coughs> excuse me, his great grandfather was the original Gerard to plant vines on the Lesmont's Dame's Vineyard, which is in the hamlet of Chavignol. And Anthony's brother, David, joined the business in 2015. So that's where you get the Anthony and David Gerard. And they farm three hectare acres on Lamont's Dames, where their vines are now more than 70 years old. Hmm. So th it, this kind of reminds me, this vineyard of, um, you know, in Burgundy. Um, oh my gosh, my mind is drawing a blank. You know, the um, Chardonnay. I have a picture of me standing in front of it. I don't know. Famous Chardonnay. <laughs> My mind is drawing a blank. So I'll think of it after this. Uh, <laughs> over. But that's it, it, this supposedly the Sauvignon Blanc that comes from this vineyard is just incredible. Hmm. And um, I don't think I have any pictures. Um, so, um, the Lamont Danes vineyard is extremely steep and everything is, um, hand harvested. Um, they, uh, actually, um, use winches to transport the grapes up and down the slopes. Oh, wow. Uh-huh. That it, image is very, uh, deceiving. Yes. Because... It, I, you can tell, you can tell there's an incline, you know, um, that for looking at it, the left of the image, you can tell is a higher grade than the right of the image, Right. but it doesn't look like it's a very steep incline. Right. Not like but, in like Austria. Yeah. But if they're using wenches and stuff, then. Yeah, it must be. So it's a chalky, uh, Kimmeridgen limestone. Um, which is um, the product of fossilized seashells from a Jurassic area um, that produces the wine of, you know, this elegant, classy, you know, going out to be the star of the show uh, wine. And they say, you know, just similar, they, they compare it to like the Grand Cru of Chablis um, because this, this is what they're... Uh, it's like the grand crew of Sauvignon Blanc that comes from this vineyard. Um, so it is um, harvested and it is fermented um, using ambient yeast in stainless steel tanks. Mm -hmm. And it's aged um, as well for creating a white, um, it says here, a white wine of breathtaking purity and primal energy. Now this is a 2018. <laughs> So this wine is oh. is three years old. So to me, I I kind of like drinking my Sauvignon Blancs within a year or two. Mm -hmm. I probably would never have picked this off the shelf personally. To but that's where I'm curious of if there's a regulation of how long they have to hold it because mine is a 2019. So that's why I'm curious about that. Huh. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm going to Google. The, uh, this is the label. And it's it's just really, it, it is nice. Um, like I said, I do feel the oily texture mm -hmm. on it. Um, there is hints of um there's hints of grapefruit pear maybe green green dark green apple on the um nose. okay well it is a cool wine region so that that makes sense i get more grapefruit on the palate i get other mm -hmm. citrus notes probably more like lemon lemon uh could even be a meyer lemon um because it's not a real strong bitter lemon you know type of thing um and i almost when i first tasted it i got a little honeysuckle but i think really 
just when I first poured it, opened it. I don't get that now. I don't get that now. So, but it is, my hair is driving me nuts. It is, um, <laughs> it is, it is nice and it's elegant. Um, I mean, I like it. It's, it's not, you know, it's just amazing to see the whole difference of the, the same group of the same grape grown in, in the different regions and how much the, the terroir really right. affects what is in your glass. Absolutely. So this says that most Sancerra is produced without malolactic fermentation and very little oak influences. Um, however, recently more producers are beginning to experiment with oak fermentation and, and or aging. Hmm. So I don't know. I, I like it with no oak. I like, see, I, I'm kind of picky because I like the expression of the fruit. Right. See this to me either has oak influence, like it's not buttery. It's not, it's not like that, but it either has oak influence or it went through a partial mallow. It's just too full bodied. It's just too, you know, um, uh, not enough fruit for me that, that, the, that it's say that to me, I don't know, maybe my palate's off today. I don't know. Um, uh, and also, uh, the yields of Sincere are limited to a maximum of 60 hectoliters per hectare, uh, where the rosé and rouge are 55. And then minimum alcohol content is 10.5, but there is no um, maximum. There is no maximum uh, ABV regulation, but it doesn't have, I, it doesn't have anything about um, does it age for X amount of time or, you know, in bottle for X amount of time before release. So, I mean, I don't know. This is a 19. So, it's mine is like really only kind of if you think of selfing a blank, we're probably drinking 2020s, right? Right for for New World, so yeah, 2019's not that far, but you you've got a 2018. So, so. I mean, I wonder what kind of year 18 was. You know, their growing season. So yeah, I mean, being cool weather, that green apple. You know, at, you know, as the temperatures increase, you go more into that tropical zone as they. Yeah you know, as cool weather, you get those green apple, um, you know, more herbaceous. My 19th, I don't really have herbaceousness in here. Do you know. have any? No, I don't know. No, I, I'm getting now that it's kind of been sitting for a while, I'm getting a little pineapple, a little tangerine, like, oh, no. wait, maybe not tangerine. Wait, no, that might be peach. Peach, not tangerine. More like more like a peach. Um, so there is tropical notes, and there's a little bit of flower. There's a little bit, uh, but they say this. Um, this says, "Drink now through 2030." Oh, I don't know if I would. <laughs> Drink it in 2030, let alone 2025. Yeah, well, how now? Yeah. You, you know what? You know, I don't know. That's that's a pretty broad out there. I, and that's another thing. Um, I don't know about yeah. Sincere, about uh, with their aging. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. That's something you got to uh, corve in and make sure you got to, you know, know for when you drink it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, I'm going to move on to food pairings. So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, right, we know that Sancerre is really known for Sauvignon Blanc, but it is also uh, have uh, some Pinot Noir. So I did the food pairings in two different ways. I did some food pairings for Sauvignon Blanc, and then I did food pairings for if you were lucky enough um, to find one. 
now, according to Sancerre's website, um, the aging potential is really only two to three years <laughs> for the Sauvignon Blanc. And they say up to five for 10 for some of the cuvées. So they're disagreeing <laughs> with them. All right. So for the Sauvignon Blanc, um, we have grilled peach, rice, and arugula salad. And I actually really think that this one would go well with, with mine. It would go well with mine too. Yeah. Um, and then spaghetti, a la, I don't know, with what are those things? Clams? No, yes. not cheddar, girl. Yeah. Yeah. Um, remove the clams and I, I'm okay with that. Okay. But, um, I don't know. I think the pancetta, I can see the pancetta uh, working well with this. Okay. Faux gras, not happening. Not happening to me either. <laughs> and it actually does say game birds. I can uh, see that having been to France. Um, and if I had gotten served any more... It was game. Oh God, yeah. It was, <laughs> it was yeah. I see this um, going nicely with that. Okay. All right. Um, and then uh, obviously, you know, uh, spicy foods. And this, I think, firecracker chicken, I think, would be actually really good with it. Um, it because that's just the Sauvignon Blanc, and it does have that higher acidity. It's just in a different form than what we're used to in the New Zealand ones. But I do think this would go well. What about you, Deb? Um, I don't know. You think I it's? Think it might go well because it's not. Um, I uh, it's spicy food, and I think when I think of spicy food, prepare it. I want to pair it with a wine, maybe that's got a little bit of residual sugar in it to combat, oh, okay. to, to combat the, the spiciness yes. in it. Um, I can see where that's, that's kind of fried. So I, I can, I get the fried and, and the right. part. Um, I'm not sure I'm buying into the spice. No. I think that it, it can coat your tongue to calm down, calm down the heat. Like because the oiliness and the. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then the next ones I have are for the Pinot Noir. Okay. So Pinot Noir, they, it's fried chicken, lamb chops, you know, typical things that you can do with, um, Pinot, uh, Asian chicken. Okay. Sticky Asian chicken. Veal Francais. Now see, I almost would say the veal with the Sauvignon Blanc. Really? Because the... <laughs> Butter, um, lemony sauce. Yeah, there is a there there is a little lemon. There's a little bit of citrus in here, so it might be able to bring that out. Yeah, it can be. Yeah, that was their recommendation for their Pinot. Um, but you know, as as we say all the time, everybody's palate is different, and you never know what pairing's going to. You know, there might be textbook this is the best pairing and it's just not for you right. so give it a try and see where it goes yeah so we'll end here with um oops some fun facts fun facts so Mm -hmm. my notes here. This is what this is what I think is one of the most intriguing things about Sancerre. Because yeah. it's so close to Chablis. Mm -hmm. It is located at the eastern edge of the Loire Valley's main vineyard area, and it's closer to Cote d'Or in Burgundy than it is to any of the Loire Valley Valley's wine districts. It's only 50 miles from Chablis. I mean, it's not Far at it all. has so much more similarities with Chablis than with the rest of the Loire. <laughs> yep. Mm. I'm having a hot flash, so I got to drink some wine. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
so here we go with the geeky on the on the um, soil. So the Kimmer, how do you say it again, Lori? Kim, Kimmergen? Kimmergen soils of Chablis are featured in Kimmer Ridge. Kimmer Ridge. In the Kim, no Kimmer Kimmeridgian. Kimmeridgian. Okay, soils are of oh, Chablis are featured in the terroir of Saint Cyr, and the ridge extends down through Chablis. So that's that's the. I'm using my pointer, but nobody can see. We can it. see it. <laughs> <laughs> So, but I just think that is so cool. Um, sorry, I was just getting really into the soil. Um, so there are three different types of soil in the um, Cancia region. The Caliotes is 40% and it's pure limestone. Terras Blanches, which is the uh, it's also 40%, and that's the Kimmergen uh, clay limestone, and the Silex, which is flint. And this um, lays out where the different soils are in the area. And I know you can't even see me doing this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, World War II put San Sierra on the map, and a lot of um, Parisians didn't want to visit the beaches in Normandy, so they went to San Sierra and discovered the wine region. So Route 7 passes close to San Sierra, and it became the new hot spot for travel. So they, they talk about Route 7 being similar to Route 66. 66. <laughs> you know, and people started, you know, taking the train down and, and everything. Um, and that's how, you know, it kind of boomed with uh, tourism and, and wine, too, because they really like the wines that they were drinking in, in San Sierra. And uh, so Sauvignon Blanc accounts for 80% of the production, and Pinot Noir and Gamay are the reds that are produced in the Appalachian. Um, and going way back, that the Appalachian was actually... Yeah, as Lori covered, it was really known, first known for the reds, the Gamay and the Pinot before it was ever known for Sauvignon Blanc. So, I mean, that's all I got. All right. And we're coming up on nine o'clock. Yes. Yeah. So uh, thank you, everybody. <laughs> really? What, Deb? The hour really flies by. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. It's a fast hour on Wine yes. Quebec Street. <laughs> I hope everybody's enjoying um, us. Nice to Are either of you guys, Lori or uh, Michael, Karen, are you drinking us, Dan Um, I don't know. Well, while they're telling us if they're drinking a Sancer, next month we are up to the letter T and we are going to be doing. Uh, Tavel, which is known for their, well, they are rosé. Yeah. Um, so we're going to be do, we're going to be talking about that. And we are having a special guest, um, Val Caruso from uh, 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 Wine Unboxed or Val Unboxed um, and uh, Vino with Val. And so check her out on social media and she's going to come in. And the reason why we're uh, having her come is because uh I, she has a podcast of her own and I listen to it and she has done a couple of podcasts on Tavel and she just really, really loves it. So we're going to kind of geek out together with her and let her share her expertise on the topic as we drink some Tavel. So I'm looking here, Michael. Oh, no, no one's got any. Oh, you don't have no. a sear in your cellar. Well, you might have to get some because they're supposed to age well. Yes. So, Deb, who, um, when is the next date? The next date. Good question. It's, um, see, I'm all discombobulated from uh, this restaurant shit. Ooh, I should be, shouldn't, I shouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> my, my thing froze. 
It is whatever the, let me look up the calendar. It's the third, right? The third. Is it the 19th or 18th or something like that? It is, if that's June 21st, I think. Yeah, 714, June 21st. Okay, and um, we are going to be drinking next month. We're going to be drinking. We're going to be drinking. Chateau de Aqueria Tavel Rosé. It's a 2018. This is what we'll be drinking. Yes. So we will be sipping on that and listening to Val Caruso tell us all about the wines, how they're made, what makes them special. So we hope you can join us. And thank you guys very much for joining us tonight. And uh, we hope you learned a little bit more about San Sir. And um, enjoy. Have a great month. Yes. I, I'm kind of. Slancha. Cheers. Bye.